Okie dokie. Hello, how are you? This is Franz Cantor here, cartoonist, illustrator, toon talker, um, cartoon watcher. Um, doing another drawing today. This is a very special drawing, actually. Um, I'm just going to show you something from my um, album here. From That's me as a kid. That's my sister. Um, this fellow is the subject of today. His name is James Kimsey. He's an Australian cartoonist and uh, best known, of course, for um, Ginger Mix. But I remember him from this era, which is the Cartoon Corner era, and he played a character on Channel 9 called Skeeter the Paperboy. So, um, that's when I remember him, and I've always remembered him for his generosity and his uh, friendship over the years. Sadly, passed away in 2007. Um, so, these are some photographs. I'm going to be working from this uh, shot here which is uh, Ginger Meg's um, era when he first started um, he was working on Ginger Meg's and um, this is from the Channel 9 era this is how I obviously remember him um, I believe he designed the logo for the that uh, 70s and 80s uh, logo that they used um, we'll talk more about Marilyn and uh, all of that in a sec just thought I'd go back to the wiki. Um, so he was born in uh, 1948 and uh, passed away in 2007. Um, Australian cartoonist, best notable for producing the comic strip Ginger Meggs, originally created by Jimmy Banks, who is this fellow, right? And he created the comic strip in 1948, uh, I think, or uh, hang on a sec, I'm not quite sure. 1948, no, no. Um, sorry, I don't even know. I can't even remember. Anyway, um, he originally created the comic character. And, uh, of course, um, uh, was passed on uh, to a couple of other artists, which uh, I can't uh, reference at the moment. Um, and then eventually to James Kemsley. And um, James was born uh, in Sydney, in Paddington, um, and uh, what else can I say? He, he attended uh, NIDA. Um, he, uh, where else? RADA in London. Um, and he became, in the 70s, he became known as the television personality Skeeter the Paperboy, uh, which started out on the Super Flying Fun Show and then Skeeter's Cartoon Corner in Sydney and Melbourne on the Nine Network. Now, on that show, in that era, of course, I was a big Hanna-Barbera fan, as was Kemsley, actually. And um, he used to play cartoons like Wacky Races and things, which I absolutely adored. Now, I've done a little uh, sketch based on a couple of drawings. We're going to go through just uh, this Banksy. Banks, sorry, not Banksy. Banks, J Jimmy Banks, or James Banks at his desk. We're going to do a caricature of him one day soon. This is uh, James drawing. This is him in Cartoon Corner. Right. And this is him, obviously, uh, later on when he's working on Ginger Megs. This is an example of Ginger Megs strip. It's actually quite funny. Very, very well written. Um, this one in particular this is quite good. Um, anyway, this... Um, this show, Miss Marilyn's um, Super Flying Fun Show, hosted by Marilyn Mayo, and uh, it had Emu, um, a few different iterations of Emu. This is um, uh, Marty and Emu. Uh, Miss Marilyn, um, very interesting show. Basically, before school, uh, you get to watch Wacky Races or you know, Scooby-Doo or something like that. And then when I came home from school, of course, there'd be Cartoon Corner on Channel 9 where you get to watch um, your favorite Hanna-Barbera uh, cartoons on that as well. So I had a full life of Hanna-Barbera. It's just saturated in cartoons. 
not just Hanna Barbera, but mostly Hanna Barbera. I was really fascinated in the, in the character designs uh, and the voice acting and everything. You know, were just so perfect for me. Anyway, what I've done is I've uh, done worked out a uh, a rough uh, idea for uh, James that I wanted to pursue based on a couple of things: his uh, hat and you know the era of the of the outfit that he wore on the show. And uh, also on this one, this shot here, which is nice and clear, so I'll be able to work out some details from that. Right, so let's uh, let's get into it. I'm I've actually got a little version of um, ginger as well, which I'm going to try to fit in there. I've had a bit of trouble fitting this um, concept in um, this uh, composition. But we'll we'll pursue it. We'll we'll continue to see what we can uh, what we can do. Now with a caricature, of course, we're just going to start with um, concentrating our efforts in the face area. So what I like to call the mask zone. The mask zone is the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. That's where the most of the recognition is going to be. Our our focus, of our attention, and we're using three color pencils. We're using the black, which is uh, polychroma, which is quite hard, and two soft pencils, which is a terracotta brown and a white. And the reason why we're doing that is because we've got grey paper and we're going to be drawing a um, three-dimensional uh, sketch, a caricature drawing of uh, James. That's what we're going to do. And we're doing it live, so anything can happen. Okie doke, let's go. So, um, James, I've uh, known James for many, many years since I was very young, teenager, uh, in fact. When the show first started, Skeeter the Paper Boy. And I've been, you know, friends with him and involved in theatre. Um, I used to do, he had a. a um, an amateur um, theatrical production in Edgecliff in the eastern suburbs in Sydney called Jimandai Theatre. It was just basically a, a shop which uh, had um, matinees on a Saturday and I used to do um, programs and lighting design and set the design like backdrops and things like that so yeah it was a very interesting time and I remember he had a I think it was a Honda Civic he used to silver Honda Civic he used to drive around like a like a maniac um, he was a lovely guy he was a really you know uh, generous and uh, funny and I used to catch up with him in you know fates and things like that and we'd continue on with our talk about Hanna-Barbera we had this sort of running joke when I was a kid you know that um, I bet I knew I, knew, I bet I could name more Hanna-Barbera cartoons than you can type of thing <laughs> of course you know he probably could because he was in the television business I had uh, to wait for things to be screened and you know some shows like Atomant and things like that squ squidly diddly uh, were on the ABC and of course because it's the ABC it the screening times conflicted with uh, the Flintstones or something like that so consequently, you never get to really enjoy them. So I've only seen um, some Hanna-Barbera shows. I've only seen um, little bits of over the years. But I loved Hanna-Barbera um, and, you know, James did too. He had we had a lot of uh, fun talking about their cartoons and not just Hanna-Barbera, there's a lot of uh, cartoons in general. So I think um, 
in you know my early years uh, having somebody to uh, talk to about art and uh, it was art cartoons are still art um, and how clever the shows are the, the character designs and even the voice acting and things you know it was really profoundly important so um, just trying to capture it's got this sort of uh, I don't know any other way to describe it it's sort of like an elfin aspect to him and I think it's because of his really sharp blue eyes so I'm going to try to get that youth and vitality sort of like a I don't know any other way to explain it it's kind of like a, a, a sense of um, mischief perhaps in his expressions So, my sister Sonia and uh, and I used to um, hang around with uh, James and his crew, um, Brendan White, I think it was his flatmate, Bondi Junction at the time. So yeah, we, we used to um, have fun fun times back in the day in Bondi Junction, eastern suburbs in Sydney. So, you know, growing up, of course, um, watching Cartoon Corner and Miss Marilyn, every boy's dream, I guess, Miss Marilyn, it's kind of funny. She's got this really husky voice and she's on a morning show in the daytime, in the, in the early morning before school. So it's sort of like you you get your, your um, hit of cartoons and um, other things that she used to show on there. She had a lot of uh, people, cartoonists over the years. Monty Wed, um, I think, had a, uh, a regular segment as well. So it was an interesting show. It wasn't just um, a host with cartoons, you know. And even, I think, Cartoon Corner had competitions and things. I used to send in cartoons and things and um, over the years, and uh, he would always... Um, show them on camera um, you know which was good it was because uh, kids kids need um, not recognition but sort of acknowledgement to you know they're not um, wasting their time watching and drawing cartoons um, it's another thing for a lot of cartoons that have limited animation I could not draw um, Looney Tunes, you know, uh, Bugs Bunny, because it's simply they moved too fast. There was so much, so many drawings in there and uh, very fluid, a full animation, you know, it was drawn on twos. But um, Hanna-Barbera, of course, had, it was a different story. It was limited animation, which means that you can actually see the character on screen talking for longer. And I got a sense of um, um, character design by studying their um, studying those drawings that just lasted on screen, um, and I really enjoyed that. I, that was you know I could sort of um, deconstruct it in a way. In fact, uh, to be perfectly honest, I got out of many, many bashings in school because um, I was picked on all the time. And um, 
I got out of it by drawing Hanna-Barbera characters. So, you know, wacky races and things like that, um, which is good. So, you know, thank you. Um, thank you, James, for that. <laughs> That's, um, that was interesting. So, uh, you know, self-preservation. There you go. Not that I mean the artwork looked like the ca cartoon characters, obviously, or I wouldn't wouldn't be here today. But uh, it was an interesting time, and the fact that um, they had a sense of value, um, kind I guess you could call it sort of like monetary value, you know that you're not being beaten up because you've done. Muttley and Dick Dastardly or Scooby. Um, so it was uh, self preservation for sure. It's an interesting um, tr transactional approach to artwork. So I've always found artwork, cartoons, or the illustrations that I did even from a young age. They had a value, so they served a purpose. They weren't just, you know, um, done and that's it. They had a, um, trying to get his um, sideburns in. They had a, a, um, a value and save my skin on many a time. Oh, this is good. So get into the textures around his uh, face now. So when I was in, working in the newspapers, of course, the both the Herald and then eventually the Australian, um, I was uh, uh, freelancing, which is another way, not freelancing, but like a casual employee. I wasn't there nine to five, five days a week. So I only worked there a couple of days. But occasionally, uh, you know, um, James would... Uh, would pop in and we'd have a good yarn and catch up. He'd just be like driving back from Barrel or someplace to deliver the uh, comics for that week or that month. I don't know how far he uh, he worked, how far ahead he worked. So um, he fostered my interest in cartoons and drawing, and um, you know that's not a that's not a light thing to say. That's it was important. Um, you know, I was like thirteen or fourteen at the time. So the fact that you did something that. Uh, he thought was meritable and worthy to put on camera um, during your cartoon, uh, the sh your favorite cartoon shows, you know, meant a lot. So it's like recognition for time, which I thought was well spent and, um, you know, I mean, not that I ever got in. I mean, you know, my father and my mother, as I said to you before, they were very supportive of of my um, interest in drawing. It's 
So let's try to get some, go get a shadow underneath here. Now, I'm going to try to, there's a particular, um, uh, let's try to, it's too much um, pencil. Okay, so you had this striped um, outfit. So it's kind of like a, a paper boy trope in a way uh, from what year I don't know but um, it just worked and it was a good show actually his, his um, cartoon corner of course was taken over by um, Daryl Summers um, but he um, he actually turned it into a bigger thing, like Hey Hey It's Saturday. It became in the end, so he had a lot more. Um, they had a bigger budget, shall we say? They used to do. Um, they call up, right? So they call people, viewers, you know. And it'd be like a magic word or something, or they play the game Double Nine, um, which were dominoes. It's actually what the logo is based on. Um, based on like the dots on a domino uh, piece. I'll try to get the um, a nice clear shot. Okay, so. I'm just, I'm not doing his version of um, Ginger, I'm just doing a quick little sketch. Okay, I'll fix that up later. Right, just get this straight. You know, whenever you work from an angle, of course, everything goes berserk, doesn't it? All horizontal lines. Uh, they take on a lean. There you go. All right, so let's get into some details here. We've got a black pencil, and we're going to start usually around the pupils so his pupils are quite small in a lot of this because he's got very light blue eyes and there is actually a reflection from the spots which uh, make them lighter again so let's try to tonally work out uh, where we're going The next area is just a strategy of working out contrast in different levels. So you start with a basic structure of form and then you start to build up the contrasts with the black pencil. And if you need it to be even more contrasty, of course, there's other elements. You can use a black brush pen or something like that. So it just gives you a little bit more emphasis on different um, aspects of the face. So you've got quite a lot of uh, contrast. It's got like a, a five o'clock shadow and quite heavy in this shot anyway, so heavy um, eyebrows, a lot of hair, which is good, gives it more character. So when you do caricatures, of course, you always look for something, an opportunity. So this is a three-quarter shot of 
James, which is good. Because then I can get a chance to draw um, the head at an angle. So when you draw the head at an angle, of course, you, you get more perspective and it looks more dynamic and more interesting than, you know, a, a front-on front -on image. Front on reference. Um, here we go. So hopefully, with all of these elements, we'll get enough uh, recognition and hopefully some expression that uh, I can relate to, that I remember. You know, Back in the uh, 70s, of course, NIDA was the place to go if you're interested in television or acting. I was uh, interested in theatrical design um, at one stage as well, but uh, I think um, I didn't do too badly. I went into a career of illustration. So I'm not really complaining. Just would have been, I think it would have been nice. I, I, it was a thing to do, you know, in the, in the 70s. Um, NIDA, and I had a lot of friends who were acting and they enjoyed it. And I, th I, th I would have enjoyed it as well. I did do some productions in high school okay so I'm going to um, lean on this and hopefully not smudge it much as I can You can see I've moved the frame uh, around a little bit because I wasn't happy with the balance of negative space. Um, I just felt it was a little bit too skewed to one side. Okay, let's go back to the hat. Now, the hat. Um, it's almost like a uh, 1920s European Sternowski hat, uh, like a John Lennon hat, which was perfect for the era, of course, so kudos to the costume design for the show, but um, It was uh, it was not a baseball hat, so it wasn't the usual hat that you'd see on most people that you could get, because Stanowski's and um, you know they're obviously a Polish hat company. A lot of uh, places didn't carry them. I've got uh, a bunch of uh, Stanowski hats that I use, because. Um, Um, I found them that suits me. I like them. I feel comfortable with them. I don't like baseball. I don't like hats. Um, but uh, this sort of hat I do like. I think it's um, 
it's of an era, isn't it? Reminds you of John Lennon or Fiddler on the Roof or Paper Boys from the 1920s. Sitting, standing on a street corner in New York. You know, paper, get your paper. Or in London. This one I've got on today. So, Stanowski. Don't have a. Uh, it doesn't. Some of them don't have. The, so, actually, that's a uh, um, corduroy. And uh, James used to wear corduroy hats too. So it's probably in reference to to him. Be nice to get a darker uh, tone in the in the hat. Uh, unfortunately, this is a pencil, so there's only little. Um, there's only so much tone you can put in there. So I'm trying to build a sculptural drawing, so it's not really a lot of, um, you know, painting or coloring. Of course, um, this process of working with these three color pencils is an interesting approach that comes from da Vinci actually because some of da Vinci's work was um, done with chalk and like a Conti crayon and charcoal and we kind of know that because of the fact that the drawings or the paintings have um, they're like the Mona Lisa for example clearly references a very tight drawing and if you believe the story that there are more than one because he used to copy his work he did it with the Last Supper um, which was a Fresco, and he hated frescoes because there were a lot of frescoes take a long time to do. Um, it's painting on wet plaster, and it's quite a process. So, um, and there's no way of, of automating it or making it easier on yourself. So uh, I don't know why I'm telling you this. This is a, a, a sort of a this is scuttlebutt for Da Vinci fans. Um, he, um, he used to mix oil paint with the fresco just to, to hurry the process up. And of course, you know, where the Last Supper painting is situated in front of a, a kitchen. Uh, so that wall was subject to a lot of uh, moisture over the years and, you know, the um, consequently um, the fresco had to be retouched because it wasn't total fresco it was part fresco and part oil paint and other mediums that he would use so it was damaged um, by time and uh, so they didn't really know they weren't really sure what colors um, the originals, the original world was until they found the um, the copy in uh, Belgium, I think, in a church in Belgium. Um, and then they were be able, they were able to refer back to, ah, oh, that's what the original color was. Okay. So tell people that uh, Da Vinci is very lazy. I don't know if he was lazy or not, but it just sounds good, doesn't it? Like he didn't. He was so impatient. He didn't wait for that. He did not like frescoes. He didn't do too many frescoes. Um, 
just did not like them. They're very difficult, troublesome process. He loved oil paint. Oil paints are very friendly. The pigment just uh, so malleable, so movable, you can move it around. Um, it remains wet for a long time. Okay, I think we've got a bit darker with that, so I'll just lighten this a little bit. We're going for the pencil seems to be able to hold its own, doesn't need a sharpening just yet. So I'm going to attack this with a white pencil in a few minutes and you'll start to see a bit more form come out of the grey paper, which is why I'm using grey paper. So back in the days of Da Vinci, where this one of the start, one of the um, originators of this concept of working tonally, drawing tonally, right? I mean, it actually goes back longer, back to the cave paintings of um, Europe, where they use charcoal and chalk and ochre, red clay and things to paint on the cave walls. And they're very beautiful, very tonal drawings, lovely drawings. So the brown gives the skin tones a very warm, living um, effect. And, you know, that's, that's what I like. Good to sort of, I mean, I'm kind of lining up these, you know, the, the teeth. Um, basically, you've got uh, to think about the center line over the form, right? So the center line, of course, if you've got uh, the two, you know, the buck teeth or the two teeth that are, that are in the center of your <laughs> center of your your jaw, um, these these things here, these things. So that if you can imagine, there's a line that goes through an invisible line that goes through the whole of the form itself, right? And um, uh, creates a left and right side um, that changes with dynamically changes with uh, perspective, and you know it's. When you find that right, it's sort of like a sweet spot. When you find it in the drawing and you refer to it, it's really nice. Very nice. So that doesn't mean you draw over the face, you know, working lines, but um, it's nice when it, when you, when the drawing somehow refers to it in some way it just feels right it's a nice little crosshatch uh, here to explain the the beard line nice curve happening here probably going to strengthen that line with a brush in, in a few minutes okay so we go just simplifying the, the outfit a little bit
So yeah, I had Miss Marilyn's um, Super Flying Fun Show in the mornings and James's Cartoon Corner in the afternoon. So my life was full of cartoons, just completely full of cartoons. It's all I was interested in in my life cartoons and then you know comics and would have started out probably as comics of the cartoons because you know Gold Key and Dell used to put out uh, other you know Hanna-Barbera titles we used to, we used to also get um, I think Flintstones was in the newspapers too so that era, even like comics, like Ginger Mix and, uh, you know, obviously Peanuts and a whole plethora of different styles. So it was a interesting life, an interesting time, a lot of fun. Even cartoons that are more adult, like um, Brenda Starr, I love that too. I didn't realize till years later that uh, the 1940s children were getting these comics in color during the war because they printed them in beautiful color in America. And uh, they used to buy them and insert them into the newspapers here. How did I find that? Well, my father was a builder, was a carpenter, and he used to renovate kitchens. And he would rip up the lino, and guess what found under lino? New old newspapers. So that was a very, very exciting um, time to see Brenda Starr in beautiful color, full color, because he had massive presses in America, of course. We never had color here. Um, we had crap color when they introduced color. We had spot color, which was, you know, it was like, this, uh, actually, we've got an example of um, the color. I'll just show you very quickly. Oh, that's no, that's it was kind of like that. So you only get two colors yellow and red. That's all So that's all you get um, Which is disappointing But to see what the kids get got in the 40s was really um, interesting for me Because they had uh, They had a better time the American comics Dick Tracy in color magic Phantom wasn't in color because that was obviously Australian um, or you know black and white So remember at the fates and things that he would be a, a a guest, you know, celebrity in the seventies. Channel Nine Skeeter, the paper boy, appearing, uh, and he'd usually. I think they used to have um, like a tent and they'd show like a projector and they'd show cartoons because cartoon hey you know cartoon corner what are you gonna what are you gonna show so he would introduce cartoons 
great cartoons like Hector Heathcote and things like that. Mr. Magoo. Because uh, these were from reels and, you know, Super 8 and 16mm reels. So they didn't have television cartoons like Hanna-Barbera from memory. Well, they may have had like Mr. Jinx or something. So the white is able to capture a lot of texture and you know that's really um, what this is uh, best for, this is what this is useful because it gives a sense of realistic um, three-dimensional properties to a drawing. Essentially it's still a drawing but, you know, it has three-dimensional properties. This is a lot of fun. I'm enjoying this. I've kind of, sort of, uh, I think I'm, I've got a likeness. I'm, I don't know, you guys be the best judge. Um, but I'm enjoying the process nonetheless, you know, there's a lot of interesting elements to the drawing process that I quite like. Actually, let's try to get a, a side shadow, perhaps. Let's see if I can do this. Um, so if there's a light coming in from there, there should be a shadow. So next to the shadow, we'll put a highlight, a bit of shine, and that just uh, will accent ex ex accentuate the uh, shadow a bit. Cool. Right. So let's uh, let's get back into. I haven't quite finished uh, this area. I've just noticed. Who's done a, you know, again, you know, people that are in the arts, they use their face a lot for uh, communicating and, f you know, for work. You know, that's what you'd expect, an actor or personality, you know, that's, that's what they're, they're for. So there's a lot of muscle in James's. James's face. Of course, it's got that sort of youthful. I mean, he's young here as well, but which helps with <laughs> youthful looks. Um, but he has got a lot of very young. He's got a very young um, face. Okay. Strengthen some of these lines and then get to it quickly with a uh, white pencil and sharpen her up a little bit. Make sure that she's not carrying any other foreign colours. Oh, maybe a bit of shine in there. Yeah, so I don't know. I, I think I may have um, sent in. I can't remember, to be honest. I may have sent in a, a cartoon of him or of somebody, probably from the show.
So we used to have shows that are dedicated to cartoons. And one of them was Cartoon Corner. And, you know, and another was uh, obviously in the morning, Super Flying Fun Show. He had shows with personalities that, um, you know, introduced cartoons. That's just, that was just a thing. You don't have that today. So back then, you know, um, that was a big deal, cartoons. And people loved them. You know, now you don't have them the same. Well, people love cartoons, of course, but they'll always do that. But just having a podcast or a radio show or a TV show or something that um, talks about the, you know, sometimes the process of making cartoons or just the fact that you've got somebody that's talking about something you love you know, whether it be toys or cartoons or whatever, it's important a lot of muscles here that I'm, I'm getting the shine on uh, reflections in the texture I think I'm going to build in a uh, side light here as well so um, I'll explain that in a sec but basically what happens is um, you have a reflection that's coming in from the side and if you refer to that in the drawing um, it kind of gives your drawing a little bit more three-dimensional um, three-dimensional properties cool this is nice got some shine there So not just the outline, not just the lines, you know, the contours that you see. You're drawing volume, you're drawing um, form and texture. So there's quite a lot happening in the drawing process itself. And that's why I like these. That's why I think, um, you know, they're fun because you're thinking about other things other than the likeness. So, you know, I mean, you, you're obviously concerned about the likeness, but it's not the overriding um, factor. So I'm going to, I think, hit this with a brush in a moment. Right, um, okay, this is it. This is a POSC, it's a paint pen, and it's quite opaque, quite strong. And this is a fine point, so it's going to give us the ability to get in some light reflections, help intensify the expression. side light again so give it a little bit more emphasis and contrast where you need it uh, let's see it's usually a bit of shine at the top of the eyelid a little bit and we've got the light catching the, the teeth here um. 
Good. Might actually, even though this is a obviously a cloth texture, might just sort of uh, help the. Oh, that's too much. Contrast a little bit. Of course, this is shiny. This is the the bauble on the side. The pin, whatever you call it. Right, here we go. Nearly there. Getting closer. So I'm just building up contrasts. That's all. That's all I'm doing. Just helping it. It's already there, but I'm helping it along a little bit more. Poor old Ginge. How much, um, how much is too much? It looks like he's inebriated. Never mind. Guess to, kids have to grow up sometime, don't they? Let's see what else I can do here to get myself into more mischief. Um, this is a, a, a brush version of the Posca marker, so it's going to give me a little bit of a softer edge and of course it goes thick and thin so you're able to feather the uh, effect a little bit more. Um, actually what I might do while I'm here might um, Lighten this up, touch around the um, that, uh, point of light there, so that brings it, makes it softer. The, the bulb part of the end of the nose. Yeah, good. All right. So, um, what else can I do here? Let's see. This is a brush pen which I got today. And of course you're able to get a little bit more black into the pupils, eyelashes maybe. And uh, eyebrows. Uh, it's a nice thick and thin look. Because the harder you press it's a brush, uh, the harder you press the thicker the line. It can give you very sharp um, Thin look too. That's a nice uh, feathering effect there. Quite like that. Wish I was better at brush work. Okay, so um, that's good. What I think I might do. Oh, there's a thing there to fix that. That doesn't look nice, it's disappearing hat. So fix that up a little bit there. Right, so what I think I might do is um put a tone in the background. 
into any kind of tone, but um, I think I might do something that's dramatic with a black Posca. It's not very much cutting in here, so I should hit it with a thicker uh, Posca in a sec. Nearly said texture. Poscas are opaque paint pens. They're not um, spirit-based markers. So they're still permanent in that they don't fade. Um, and they dry very quickly like a spirit marker. But they're very, very solid very very um, opaque which is really cool very handy because that's what you need um, you know I don't want to be here painting this in with Indian ink just wouldn't dry fast enough plus Indian ink has other undesirable qualities which I've found over the years Just gives us a nice little cutout effect, which really um, exaggerates the contour a little bit more. So I'll put X here. This means I'm going to color that in. If you see um, Jack Kirby originals, you'll see. That <laughs> does happens a lot. Comics. Sometimes um, they forget to color it in. So you literally see an X in the sky. What a lovely, generous personality James has. You know. He didn't have to be so um, generous, but he was. That was part of his nature, to be supportive. It's one of the reasons, one of the principal reasons why I draw because outside of my mother and father and sister um, I had support from James and it's very important to to draw as to kids especially you know even though we don't get it perfectly at first. I mean, nobody who does, really. Uh, you don't. And even now, you know, I mean, this isn't absolutely perfect, is it? Nothing's perfect. But you still need to enjoy it and, you know, and have somebody acknowledge you and your efforts um, is great encouragement because then you feel like you've spent a worthwhile amount of time like this uh, I feel like I've spent a worthwhile amount of time drawing my friend
was James Kemsley and uh, Skeeter the Paperboy, as I remember, and um, very, very um, wonderful, warm human being, very supportive. Another lover of Hanna Barbera, <laughs> um, and uh, made a big impression on me. So his, this is James in his uh, heyday as um, Ginger Mix cartoonist and of course um, as I usually say uh, this is Franz Cantor and I will catch you on the flip side bye bye <laughs>